and Jess Hill. Online activism and being woke, it's all the rage, but can it really change the world? Q&A in just a minute. Australia Talks. And we're listening. We asked more than 50,000 Australians, almost 500... Welcome to q and I'm Frank Kelly. And tonight we're in Melbourne collaborating with the Wheeler Centre's Broadside Festival. On our panel, anti-ageism author Ashton Applewhite, Egyptian-American feminist Mona el Tahawi, businesswoman and social change agent Hannah Asafiri, Indigenous screenwriter and activist Nayuka Gori, and Jess Hill, whose latest work is challenging old assumptions about male violence. Please welcome our panel. Q&A is coming to you live across Eastern Australia on ABC TV and across the nation on iView and News Radio. And our first question tonight comes from Nisha Kot. The interim report of the Royal Commission into Aged Care has damned Australia's system as inhumane, abusive and unjustified. Yet there seems to be very little attention paid to these findings. Do we as a nation care more about parties, hats and frocks than we do about our elderly? Thank you very much. And I think that was a, a reference to what's going on at the moment with the Melbourne Cup tomorrow. So I, let's bring in an Australian on this one. Hannah, what do you think? Do we care more about parties and frocks at the Melbourne Cup than we do about our older Australians? Well, I think, um, I mean, the findings are horrific and they weren't any surprise given um, when they first came to light uh, with the ABC report, and they are horrific, but I think they are symptomatic of our attitudes towards minorities. So it's not just uh, attitudes towards the elderly. I think as a country, we have uh, positioned minorities in competition with a whole host of other issues. So I think uh, aged care and the abuses of aged care have become a consequence of uh, how we view minorities, how at best uh, we are... Uh, indifferent to them and at worst we are hostile to minorities all minorities including women disabled groups queer community muslims and for me this is part of that conversation that we need to have although specifically we need to look at what's happening in aged care yeah ashton ageism is a big part of your your work really and your thought um do you think it is separate to the other isms in a way well, it's paradoxical in that the aging, you know, is the one universal human experience. Uh, and older people, um, you know, are, are a minority of the population. Ageism, I should say, is, is any judgment on the basis of age. So young people, children, experience a lot of it too. A, a society that doesn't look after children is also ageist. Uh, I think that we have 
you, that it is indeed, I think Hannah's right, that it does represent how we treat people at the margins of society. I would say capitalism is probably the biggest driver in that we don't respect people who don't contribute in conventional economic mm -hmm. terms, which means children and retired people, even though they contribute in many ways that are harder to measure and often enable other people to contribute in conventional ways. Okay. What about, um, let's stick with the Australians for a minute because the reference was in reference to the Melbourne Cup but we've also had this Royal Commission into aged care just handed down last week and one of the findings from the Royal Commissioners was that the the shocking state of our aged care sector and it was described as sad and shocking and cruel and harmful uh, was it represented an ageist mindset Jess do you think we've got an ageist mindset in our society yeah, and I think some of it is just that a lot of us are terrified of getting old, right? And so there's probably a bit of a sense when, when our own relatives get old, some of us um, are upstanding children and we remain in their lives and we look after them and others run for the hills. And I think sometimes we don't want to look because a lot of us feel complicit um, that we didn't look after our grandparents or I know personally I feel guilt about not necessarily being there for my own nonna when she felt when she started to go senile it was it was something that I just I just couldn't accept and I probably needed to turn a blind eye to it. Um, if there was adequate state support you wouldn't feel you had to go it alone. That's also true and and of you know obviously I, I guess that when we feel complicit in perhaps our own negligence and you know you see this with the lack of men in the violence against women sector um, you know sometimes that means that we want to look away and you know when we think about things like animals I mean how many of us have buried a racehorse not many <laughs> you know um, we don't feel complicit in that we can point a finger quite purely and say what a disgusting practice that is and we don't want to be any part of it but this disgusting practice of putting our old people in aged care homes and leaving them there to literally rot in some cases is something that a lot of us are complicit in. Yeah, and there is a shocking statistic that came out in that aged care commission uh, inquiry, which is that 40% of people within our aged care system don't get any visitors. Now, Yuka, how does this, how did that strike you and, and the way we treat older people in our community? And, and as you compare that to people with, you know, Indigenous Australians, for instance. Yeah, well, I think, if I'm really honest, I think I, in Australia anyway, I think we're saying Australians, but I think if we're looking at who we're actually talking about, I don't really see that in my community. Mm -hmm. I don't... I think that we value older people in a very different way. And elders have... Yeah, elders have a higher standing in our community. And while I'm... While I'm talking, I should also acknowledge the country that we're all on and the country that we're all listening and watching on. Um, yeah, I think we have. I think we treat older people um, in a more respectful way. I think, yeah, what we're seeing is also white culture. Um, yeah, I think different cultures have different ways. Okay, I don't know, Mona. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that um, too often the white experience, the white male experience generally, but the white experience overall is taken as the default. And I think that the rest of us, um, those of us who are not white, those of us who are not able-bodied, those of us who are not men, those of us who are not those defaults end up having to explain that this is not our experience. And I think, you know, when I look at my family in Egypt, when I look at, you know, it's, it's very similar to what you're saying, that um, it's very rare, although it's... Um, some families, because they're split by migration and work abroad and stuff, it's still very rare, but I think it's really important for white people to acknowledge this as their problem and to begin learning from us. It's okay. also, also, we do also have a culture of just locking things away that we don't want to look at. So we do it with homelessness, we do it with mm -hmm. people who are incarcerated, people with disabilities. If we're, if it's too inconvenient, we'll just shut people away. And I think, yeah, this is one of those no, things. I think that's exactly what the Commission has found. <laughs> OK, our next question is from Catherine Bevan. Hi. I'm a 62-year-old woman who works full-time and I'm very fortunate to have a fabulous job. The covert ages of my experience during some interviews before securing my current role was stressful, just to say the least. One person conducted a phone interview with me and had almost guaranteed me the job until I saw that he'd looked up my LinkedIn profile photo and I never heard from him again. How do we convince employers that people who are older are great workers with so much to contribute? 
Ashton, I think we filed that one straight to you. <laughs> you know, I, on the aged care point, I just want to point out that only 5% of the population is in aged care homes. Our fears are out of proportion. Mm. This issue of discrimination in the workforce is widespread. The evidence is everywhere that, that not a single negative stereotype about older workers is true. Um, less creative, less dependable, none of that is true. Uh, so of course what we want is our employers to judge employees not by what they look like no matter what or who they sleep with, for that matter, or where they come from, but on the basis of their individual capacity. We, it, age discrimination is illegal. It's important for people to call it out. It, that doesn't make it any easier for you to get your foot in the door, which is why, uh, why I do what I do, which is to help develop a grassroots social movement, like the women's movement, which changed the way we look at women in the world. Not enough, but it started to do it. We need to do that around the position of older people in society, because uh, addressing ageism at, at its broadest level, which is between our own ears, and then how it plays out in the workforce, in our healthcare systems and everywhere, you know, that is where it has to begin so that people can look at let workers for, you know, for the capacity, the individual capacities we bring to the job. It's proving very difficult to shift. I mean, I've seen government after government decide that they're going to try and do everything they can to get more older people employed and they have subsidies and it just doesn't seem to shift. Hannah, you, you employ people. Do you employ mm. older people? I, I absolutely do. And I think it's also important to look at the gendered nature of aged absolutely. care. Mm. And when it comes to women and women who have had their careers interrupted um, and then find themselves needing to re-enter the work the workforce. So um, I'm somebody who uh, speaks to responding to circuit breaking the cycle of disadvantage for women, whether they be escaping situations of violence or whether they be experiencing societal discrimination and or finding themselves in their third age needing to come back into the workforce. And coincidentally, the highest group of homelessness in this country are women Older over 50. Women and girls. Um, so, yes, I employ them as a matter of course, but I think what we need to do is look at why that is and why uh, women's work is not recognised and how do we train women up um, so that they do and can be re-engaged inside. Okay. Our next question, it's a video from Belinda Day from Echuca in Victoria. Our mum, Tanya Day, died in custody because Victoria Police targeted her for being drunk in public. They then failed to properly care for her after they locked her up in a police cell. In all Australian legal history, no police officer has ever been held criminally responsible for an Aboriginal person's death in custody, despite hundreds of Aboriginal people dying in their care. As Aboriginal people, we know that racism was the cause of our mum's death and is the cause of so much pain and harm in this country. How do we get institutions to acknowledge racism and how should people be held to account? Nayuka, it's a big and it's a key question, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's really difficult. I think when we're talking about institutions like police, I think it's really tempting to think about how, well, how can we make the police nicer? Should we hire more black people? Should we have more women? But what we need to remember is that the police started, like its very formation was to serve the interests of white sovereignty in this country. So... I don't know if we're talking about accountability. I, I'm, I don't know how far we can go in keeping an organisation like the police to account because it's, it is there to be violent. It is patriarchal um, and it's, it is overwhelmingly white. So why, yeah, how do we... I think it shouldn't exist, but... Um, <laughs> I think, yeah, I, yeah. But, but how do we do it? Let's talk about that because but, we've had we, nearly 30 years since we had a Royal Commission to black deaths in custody. Yeah. One of the key things they found was that public drunkenness should lo no longer be a criminal offence and yeah. it hasn't changed. So if Royal Commissions aren't doing it, so how do we make this change? And are things changing? Because this is the first inquest, this one into Tanya Day's death, to formally consider systemic racism yeah. as a contributing factor. Is that a sign of improvement? I, it's like how incremental, mm. like what... Im, I'm wary of talking about Ani Tanya's 
Day's family, I think they ultimately decide what justice is for their mum. They decide, like, in all of these discussions, we should be centering the family and what they want. But as an observer in the community and being on the outside, but also being a black fella, I think having police investigate themselves is not a way. I, don't, I can't see how accountability can come <coughs> from that. Um, and that still, that still happens, and that's always happened. So, I, yeah, I don't know. Also. Mona, how do we get institutions to, you know, acknowledge racism and do something about it? How do we hold people to account? Well, you're asking the person here who travels the world to say, fuck the patriarchy. So I think that the, what we have to do is start seriously talking about dismantling patriarchy. And when I talk about patriarchy, I'm talking about a white supremacist, capitalist, imperialist patriarchy, to quote Amer black American feminist bell hooks. Because what I'm hearing here is very similar to what's happening in the United States. But I also urge everyone to connect it to what so often in the news is portrayed as a problem in my country of birth, Egypt where police brutality is connected to a fascist state or a militarist state. And so it's very easy for people to say, oh, look, well, you know, the police beat Mona up in Egypt because, you know, Egypt is a dictatorship. And you rarely make that connection between the dictatorship in Egypt and here in Australia, where you're ostensibly a democracy. But what you're talking about is the overwhelming power of the state. And that state is driven by a white supremacist patriarchy. When I look at your prime minister, when I look at Donald Trump, when I look at Abdel Fattah Sisi in Egypt, when I look at Bolsonaro, all of these men are patriarchal authoritarians at the heart of the way that they rule is violence. Mm -hmm. And that violence depends, the violence is meted out to you depending on where in the hierarchy you belong. And so if you're a woman, if you're queer, if you're of color, if you're disabled, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, I say patriarchy is like an octopus. The head of the octopus is misogyny. But the eight tentacles are these things that we're talking about. So it would be um, capitalism, it would be police brutality, it would be homophobia, <clears throat> all of these systems of oppression that privilege male dominance, because we're talking about a very specifically male kind of violence, and again, according to the tentacles of the patriarchy. So for me, we have to have a serious discussion. We have to dismantle patriarchy. Does that sound like a pipe dream? It has to be a reality, because it's the year 2019, for those of us who use that calendar, and we're still talking about people being beaten to death by the police. It's unconscionable. I well, think also, if I can just jump in, um, I think, like, yes, let's talk about patriarchy, but if we're talking about a settler colonial state like Australia, we need to question where that patriarchy comes from. And colonialism is... White is supremacy. Yeah, well, but particularly also, like, it's not just racism and white supremacy, it is also wanting to disappear Indigenous people and, exactly. you know, not mm. our sovereignty not be upheld. Mm. I think the danger... Um, and I think Queensland Police is a really good example where we when we kind of zone in on one particular police officer, say Chris Hurley up in Queensland, we have this, I think we've got a bit of a culture of being able to, you know, we want to pin it on one person and just say, oh, you know, it's one bad guy or it's a couple of bad apples. But if we're thinking about the police or we're thinking about institutions, we have to understand that it's a cultural issue. It is a systemic issue. And beyond the police, it's, it's not just the police. We also have say, institutions like the healthcare system. I'm thinking of Naomi Williams up in yep. New South Wales, where she died of something that should have been preventable. She went to the doctors 18 times. And, like, racism absolutely played a role in that. And entrenched racism is, you know, unquestionable. And if the question um, from Belinda was, how do we get them to acknowledge racism institutions? Yes, you've, you've looked a lot at institutions in the work you're looking at. Mm. The police, uh, you know, a key institution dealing with domestic violence. Police, what, address a domestic violence incident in this country once every two minutes. How do we get them to acknowledge and to change? Um, and is smash the patriarchy the only Yeah, well, answer. there's that. There is smashing the patriarchy. There's, you know, I think the culture of the police is so deeply entrenched and Nayuk is totally right to talk about the history of colonisation and what's happened particularly in Australia and it is shared in many, many countries across the world. But what we've done here in Australia is we've brought, we brought over a culture, you know, in 1788 when we first started coming here that was absolutely torn apart by domestic violence and child abuse. We brought that culture here. We brought it to a nation of... Indigenous Australians who'd lived here for 65,000 plus years, 
who had survived and thrived for that long because they knew what was required to keep intimacy and emotional relationships intact. What we did is we came here, we raped and abducted their women and girls. We instilled a system of patriarchy and racism. We then, when we raped and abducted their girls, when they had white babies, we abducted them. And then we legislated for about 180 years to destroy their culture or to try to destroy their culture because we thought that they were already doomed and we were almost doing them a favour. So what I think we've come to now is, you know, we imported the violence there may have been violence in Indigenous cultures before we got here, but they live by a very strict moral code. And we have had that culture of violence that has been totally unresolved in this country for over 200 years, and we have not made peace with it. And there's no way that you're going to change police without changing the community. Police are just people. They're people mm. who live in Australia, and Australia has a very hard, long history of violence against Aboriginal women and girls and Aboriginal boys. And unless we resolve that and do some truth-telling around that, there's no chance that the police are going to be reformed. OK. But do we want them to be reformed, though? I think that's the question. What, what is it that we... I think the problem is we lack the imagination to think outside of the police. Well, you're so saying you it... don't want any police at all, but if we're no. going to have police, don't we want them to be reformed? But... If that's the paradox? But can they be? Oh, it's well, that's the question. question. How do you change yeah. an institution? It's actually not I don't, a question I think it's a waste of time mm. to try and change something like the police. It's truly a waste of time. We've been trying mm. for years and years and years. It hasn't worked. So what are different ways of dealing with the things that we go to police for? So if it's, you know, if it is... Because we do go to police for help. We do go. And that they don't help. Like, they, like, you know, know Miss Ju. Miss Ju is a really good example. Mm. You know, she went for help and she ended up dying. Mm. You know, Aunty Tanya was... She was... She was drunk in public. You know, you would help someone normally. You know, mm. there are going to be... Yeah, it should be a health response, not a police response. Well, thousands if you're of people about who are drunk the... tomorrow and they're going to be helped. Of course. So, but why, I, why I do think... we need to rely on them mm. when we can build communities to do that work for ourselves? OK, Hannah? Um, Look, I think what's missing from this whole conversation is truth-telling. Um, Indigenous and First Nation issues are not sexy and there's no currency politically to take them on in a real and meaningful way. Um, in order to... Because police behaviour is a reflection and an expression of the, the values of this, of this country. Mm. And, and I agree with Jess that truth has never been told. And... If we are genuinely about recognition, reconciliation, whatever the language we use that is relevant to First Nations people and affording dignity and respect, we need to begin by telling the truth and we need to stop the double speak. On the one hand, we appoint a minister for Indigenous uh, affairs and then at the same time, we afford them absolutely disrespect and disregard for events like Uluru mm. closure. Mm. Um, so this double speak about, on the one hand, we claim, yet those claims are hollow. OK. We have so much to get through tonight. I'm going to move us on. <laughs> Remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter. And keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check, the conversation website for the results. The next question comes from Alia Ahmad. Um, former US President Barack Obama recently said that people who are politically woke um, need to get over themselves because they're just being judgmental online and not affecting any change. Um, for many women and gender diverse people of colour, online is one of the few safe spaces to actually speak out about injustices within our community and more broadly. Um, what effect do you think that Mr Obama's words have on these already marginalised voices and what would you say in response? Mona? Um, I completely and utterly disagree with Barack Obama. <laughs> Me too. Um, I go online exactly to tell people to fuck off when they attack me. <laughs> and at this I'm point, I will well utter a language it. warning on the program. <laughs> 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 like my like yes. <laughs> no, honestly, it's, you know, this, this idea of respectability, this idea of civility, this idea of unity, all of these words, decorum, who invented those words? Those words were invented by white men for the benefit of other white men in systems and institutions that were always designed to be for white men. And they weren't designed for women like you and me and so many others. Like you said, people of colour and gender diverse people. They never imagined us in those spaces. And then we show up and we just ruin it for them. And so those who abide by the system 
And Barack Obama was part of the system and remains part of the system. Mm. I also disagree with his wife when she says, when they go low, we go high. No, I fucking don't. If you go low, I'm going to come for you. So, no, I do not have the luxury or the privilege to sit there and be civil with people who do not acknowledge my full humanity. I refuse, number one. Number two, there are so many voices who have found their platform on social media finally. Mm. after being the gatekeepers refused to let us in for such a long time. I mean, I say, I include myself because I'm kind of in and out, but there are people who have never had any platform. I'm thinking of young black feminists in the United States, indigenous feminists in the United States and Canada, because I move back and forth between the US and Canada. There is one indigenous woman in Canada who every day tweets about missing and killed indigenous women in Canada. Nobody has bothered to find out what happened to them. In the United States, really incredibly successful campaigns have happened online because we refuse to be civil to those who don't recognize our humanity. So for those who say, be civil, for those who say, be polite, I have an entire chapter on the political importance of profanity. And I remind them of a Ugandan feminist called Dr. Stella Nianzi, who is currently in prison in Uganda because she wrote a poem on Facebook wishing that the mother of the dictator of her country had poisoned him, that her birth canal had poisoned him during birth. And when she was taken to court and during her sentencing, she was videotaped in because she's known for her profanity. She stood there in the video, she took off her top, she jiggled her breasts and she said, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. <laughs> in court. Mona, I talked to you about this. <laughs> okay, you're watching. That's three. I disagree with Barack Obama. <laughs> I agree with Stella Nianzi. You're watching Q&A live from Melbourne with a panel of outspoken feminists. We're staying with this issue of protest. Our next question is from Joss Tate. <laughs> Uh, Scott Morrison is talking again about cracking down on protesters and boycotts. But when citizens' democratic rights are progressively degraded, what avenues are left for those citizens to affect political change, at least in between elections? Ashton, I knew you were keen to come on in the last question, but for this one, <laughs> if you don't know, Scott Morrison's our Prime Minister. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, as far as I can see, he was upset that um, climate change organisers were... Uh, causing grievous harm to industries that are polluting the planet. I mean, to... to, to he was very upset. He talks about a new breed of radical activism. <laughs> yeah, Is the, it a the, new breed? Uh, hardly. And, to, to, I mean, the whole discussion frame seemed almost absurd, you know, that he would uh, accuse these young climate change protesters of being selfish by disrupting a teeny-weeny bit of the corporate profits that are responsible for the plunder of the planet. Plus, if... if I mean, to, to say that exercising our rights as consumers in a capitalist society is threatening is frankly ridiculous. I mean, again, I think this is part of a bigger conversation and an ideology of a government who is moving towards censoring everybody and, and masquerading around a whole host of different... the um, civil liberties, the erosion of civil liberties and now criminalising protests... I just want to take the opportunity and talk about climate change because I think it's been led by extraordinary young people, Agreed. Mm -hmm. loud young people who don't have other avenues. And I've we older to, people need to join vote. them. Mm -hmm. They cannot vote. They are now being criminalised for protesting. Their MPs and governments are not listening to them. So I think these young people... Either we uh, come to terms with leading on climate change or there's going to be more protests. Well, we need, also, we need all ages have, on yep. deck against climate change. I mean, my, my main issue with what Obama said is that it was framed a little bit as old versus young. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. just mm -hmm. the ancient, most, you know, oldest tactic in the world to divide up groups that would otherwise sure. join forces. Uh, just, on the, yeah. just on the point that Obama was making, is there anything, yeah, old versus young, true, but what about, was there an element of it's easy on social media yes. to take a 
a pot shot at somebody and you're not actually doing th anything in yourself. But yeah. meanwhile, you know, you've caused a lot of grief for someone and, and, and nothing much has changed. Is that valid yeah. at all, yeah, Jess? it is. And there's certainly a bit of that in the cancel culture that people talk about and whatever. But, you know, I also agree with what people are saying on this panel, which is, like, there are voices on social media now that we have never heard from, you know? It's one of the best things about social media. There's some rampant <laughs> awfulness about social media, but that is the best thing. Mm -hmm. And when I was writing this book about domestic abuse, I had their voices in my head and I had their scrutiny on my shoulder uh. and it made me write a better book yeah. because I thought someone can call me out. If mm. I write something that isn't nuanced enough or if I mm. betray, you know, the principles or whatever mm. I do, someone's going to call me you out for it. You will be And out. it was great. I, I, I want to address further the protest point because I think this is a really significant moment in your history. And I say this as that Egyptian-American because, you know, one part of me, Egypt, had... We began a revolution in 2011, and it's not gone very well, obviously. And the other part of me is the American, and we have this fascist fuck called Donald Trump as president. And your prime minister here is a mini version of Donald Trump, because we're talking about white supremacist capitalists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and we've got Donald Trump is a wannabe dictator. He wants to be able to do what the fascist president of my country of birth is doing. And when your prime minister, who is also a Christian evangelical, like Mike Pence in the United States, the evang white evangelicals in the US voted for Trump. So you're on a, on a parallel path here. When they start talking about the media as enemies of the people, when they start talking about banning boycotts, you have to start asking what is happening to your so-called democracy. As young people and people of all ages, not just young people, are rising up against the world. I mean, in the, across the world, Chile, Hong Kong, Lebanon, Iraq, people are risking their lives for the sake of protest. And your ostensibly democratically elected prime minister wants to ban boycotts. Boycotts helped end apartheid exactly. in South Africa. Oh, yeah. So ask yourself, yeah. where is he taking you? And they you? test your boundaries as well. But, you know, that's... But also, Naika, this Morrison government wouldn't be the first government to... You know, have a crack at protesters, young protesters. I mean, it, we never... Show the Peterson. Well, yeah. Vietnam, I mean, it, yeah. you know, is it... Are we just seeing a usual cycle here or is it something different, do you think? Um, well, I wasn't around during Vietnam. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, for, it, it does seem like business as usual. And part of me is... <clears throat> pardon me. Part of me is thinking, well, perhaps there is something that people are doing right now that's really effective and scaring the shit out of him, which is great. Totally. But we really, we really have to be, I think, wary if we think about the digital sort of invasion of our privacy and legislation that's enabled that, as well as I think there's been a creep towards giving police more powers against protesters, like Queensland, Queensland's mm. looking at it down here in Victoria. I think, so, yeah, Scott Morrison can say what he wants, but then there's things like, you know, they'll, how do you legislate against boycotts? I, I don't even know how well, that's, that's... No, I'm not sure totally. they know either. I don't, so, but they're, they're thinking I think about that's, it. That's, uh, the that's point. But that's a promise. For me, when I hear him say that, that's him trying to mm. get in with the Resource Council. That's him... Virtue signal. Yeah, he's mm. just trying to... Yeah, I'm on your side, guys. I don't know how much he can actually do, oh, but, but all, yeah. on the state level, particularly on the state level, we need to make sure that we're... Mm. Just before, before we, just before we leave the, the whole thing. protesting thing, Mona, I'm just wondering, there's a... You know, there's... There's people, kids mostly, on the streets in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. young men and women in Iraq, mm -hmm. um, Lebanon. In, in Lebanon. Chile. Is something different happening now? It's not just... It isn't just social media or what are they... You know, mm, slack no. visits, it's not oh, that. It's not. It's, it's people on the streets. It, it's, I think what we're seeing happening across the world is the rise of two things. One is we're seeing these patriarchal authoritarians, as I've said, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Trump in the US, Scott Morrison here and others... And then we're also seeing a rise of people saying no. People saying we will resist. And as a feminist, for me, feminism is the best kind of resistance to that patriarchal authoritarianism. Because when you see all of the countries rising up, they're rising up against corruption, they're rising up against capitalism, they're rising up in Lebanon, they're rising up against sectarianism. There was a women's protest on Sunday that was rising up against patriarchy, sectarianism and authoritarianism and corruption. 
So you're looking, and, and that's really essential, and I think the reason that we know about so many of them, and it's so invigorating to see, is because of social media, mm. is because we're so connected in ways that we weren't in the past. But I salute each and every person that goes out on the streets and risks their lives, and people have been killed, have been killed for rights that you take for granted. So mm. don't think that because your economy is doing well, but when you have a prime minister who wants the, the pockets of capitalist giants like coal, coal mining, how can you be talking about coal as 16-year-old young women are on the street saying, what kind of world are you giving us? So this is what we're seeing. We're seeing people who are saying, no, we deserve better against these old white men, mostly, who are saying, no, we want to keep our, our hands on everything. But, yeah, and this, clearly you have to be on this side. That's what's changing. It's not their age. It's not their race. It's their privilege. Well, I think and that a, a lot of them, it is the, the old men. Oh, they, are old, they are indeed old men. Trump. But, and many are white. But that is because of the privilege that they have enjoyed their whole lives, that they are damn, trying damn hard to hold on but to, that say. is being threatened. But also, under the been. privilege, isn't there also a disruption going on? And that's affecting um, not just the as you would say, the old white men in power, it's affecting the people in the communities who th that has been their livelihoods. This is a period of great change we're projecting here Absolutely. and living through. People I are terrified. As well, I think old white men, like, yeah, abs you know, sure, absolutely. But <laughs> when we, like, white women voted for Trump. Oh, so I, it's I not, have a whole chapter on them, I know. Yeah, we can't, yeah, I think it's a bit more nuanced than just... It's ideology. Kind of, yeah, it's easy to just say, yeah. okay, no, this one group, anyway. No, uh, <laughs> we've got many questions to get through, and this one sort of flows. The next question comes from Murray Saunder. Thanks, Rand. When trying to bring, out, bring about significant change, when is aggression and violence a better option than assertiveness, strong arguments, and modelling the behaviour you expect of others? Ashton? When none of that other stuff works. It's as simple as that? Yep. I, I have a so, great answer for this that a lot of people <laughs> do not like. I want patriarchy to fear feminism. And there is a chapter in my book on violence. There is a chapter on, on my book about white women who voted for Trump and white women who accept crumbs from patriarchy because they allow their whiteness to trump their gender. I'm fully aware of this. But at the end of the day, even those white women have to recognize that nothing protects them from patriarchy. Nothing, for me as a feminist, the most important thing is to destroy patriarchy. And all of this talk about how if you talk about violence, you're just becoming like the men. My question, so your question is a really important one, but I'm gonna answer it with another question. How long must we wait for men and boys to stop murdering us, to stop beating us, and to stop raping us? How many rapists must we kill? Not the state, because I disagree with the death penalty, and I want to get rid of incarceration, and I'm with you on the police. So, I want women themselves. I want, as a woman, I'm asking, how many rapists must we kill until men stop raping us? So, Mona, them's fighting words. Spectator Australia is already saying Mona's um, promoting violence. Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing? Well, what I'm doing is I'm saying that violence has been owned by the state, that violence has been given by the state to its police, that violence has been allowed to continue, unchecked mostly, uh, by men, especially privileged men. So exactly how long do I have to wait to be safe? Okay. And when Let I say to Murray, be safe, Murray, there's a hierarchy of safety too. Hang Obviously, on. people of colour, disabled people, etc. Murray, what do you think of that answer? How do you this, feel about this? I guess there's two things. One is... Um, there's a lot of um, smashing and destroying. Yes. But what's the alternative? So the alternative is a thing. world where I'm not raped and murdered. Yeah. I We're... would agree with that. That's a good start. <laughs> um, the other thing is too, if you think about bullying, bullying begets bullies. So violence begets violence is what I'm seeing. So well, let me ask. Let, let, let me bring. Sorry, man. Let me bring Jess in on that about the you know violence begets violence. Well. You know, it's interesting. I think if anyone's shocked by what Mona's suggesting, you just have to look back to history and a certain faction of the suffragettes in the early 20th century, they used violence. They actually... They thought what they were fighting was a civil war between the sexes. Um, they, they smashed windows. That one, one suffragette actually went up to a young Winston Churchill in 1909 and whipped him with a horsewhip um, at a railway station. I mean, like, there was... <laughs> 
someone likes that. Um, <laughs> Winston Churchill did a lot of shitty things. Um, so, you know, like, that was, for a faction, a violent movement. And the only thing that stopped their militancy was World War I. You know, if it hadn't been for World War I, there's no telling what might have happened because and they were fighting for their lives. And World War I was violence. Hang on, Mona, World War I is violence by men against men. Mona, yeah. hang on one second. Let's have It's Ashton never the, the ideal. It's never the first thing to go to. Mm. But, you know, slave rebellions. I mean, there are many causes where people have resorted to violence as a way to finally break through and get hurt and achieve what we need. And if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. I I, I, if I can just jump in, Mona... Um, so I'm thinking, I just want to bring this conversation back to the land that we're on, um, Australia, whatever. Um, like, we live in a colonial state, and I think for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we are living in a constant state of duress. We experience violence from so many different types of systems. We experience it interpersonally. Um, I don't... When you say violence begets violence, there's something kind of... It's almost sounding like it's a like a level playing field, mm -hmm. which it's not. it's not. It's absolutely not. So I think if you're defending yourself, um, then I think... I think there are... I think... I'm surprised. I wonder what our kind of tipping point in Australia is going to be when people are going to start burning stuff. Um, I look forward to it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, Mary's yeah. question was when, you know, is, when is it better off than assertiveness, <laughs> strong arguments and modelling but the behaviour you expect of others? I what? think... Oh, who's that bloody quote, like, appealing to your oppressor? Oh, you uh, can oh, uh, uh, Assault is a core. Assault is a core. It's throughout history. No one has ever gotten their right or their freedom by appealing to the moral sense of their oppressor. I don't... It's, so, it's so fascinating in this... for me that men constantly ask, oh, you don't want to become like us. You know, okay. so if I, don't use violence. Let's know to finish So I'm point. thinking about, I'm, you know, in a colony. We live in a colony. Like, I cannot... We've tried for 230-plus years to appeal to the colonisers' morality, which just doesn't seem to exist. Um, <clears throat> so it's... I think violence... Yeah, I think violence is OK. Because, like, we... If someone's trying to kill you, you know, there's no amount of... Oh, but I'm really clever, you know. I'm, a, I'm, I'm really articulate. Um, no amount of that is going to save you. So, I, yeah. It's I a think tricky... It's really burn stuff. I think that's a really good point to, a moment to go to our next question. You're watching a special broadside edition of Q&A with a panel of strong women, as you can see. And uh, we are trying to keep the language under control, but if you're offended by the <laughs> profanity, maybe leave now. I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. Our next question is from Stacey Otto. I want to know if we can change the legal system to better, change, uh, to better deal with domestic violence. Can domestic violence related charges be introduced instead of the stock standard unlawful assault and with this mandatory sentencing? The sentencing seems to be grossly inadequate for domestic related crimes. Can, now, I, Jess, say can I say something really No, quick? no, let me go to Jess first. This is her area of special interest. <laughs> <laughs> Mona is champing at the bit. Oh, no. um... Thank you for your question and, um, yes, we do see in various countries that, diff that changes, massive changes are being made to legal systems. Um, you know, I think in terms of, say, for example, what we were saying before about, you know, you go to the police first, right? So the police are the first people to respond, you know, um, and we're talking about what, happened, what would happen if you just didn't have the police, right? You know, in, across Latin America, the police betrayed women so flagrantly, you know, like into forced pregnancies, abducting their babies, etc., through the dictatorship, um, the regimes, that after those regimes fell, there was no point in having those police respond to women's concerns. And so they thought up something entirely new in those countries, and they were police stations for women that were staffed by women. And the effect of that that has, has carried on for the last 30, 40 years, um, has had an incredible effect on the way that women feel confident enough to report. They feel like their concerns will be taken seriously. It's actually had a, a, an enormous rate on the domestic homicide rate in, in Brazil, for example. They've had um, the domestic homicide rate dropped for all women in the neighbourhoods where these police stations are present by 17%. 
In the cities, for young women, 15 to 24, it dropped by 50%. Jess, they also brought in a crime in Argentina, I read perhaps in your book, I, I can't recall where I read it, um, a, a crime of femicide, which carries harsher penalties than homicide. That's right. Um, one of the questions that came in earlier talked about a king hit punch here is considered worse, uh, it, it is... Is not not considered is is not is considered worse than domestic violence and abuse in terms of the sentencing. Yeah, I mean, does changing that one single change of that would that make a difference? Well, the point is that actually what women and children have been telling us for the last forty years since the refuges opened is that often the physical violence is not the worst part, mm -hmm. and sometimes physical mm -hmm. and sexual violence is not even present. It's about the perpetrator creating a believable threat of violence and then through in, in some of the worst abuse that we, that we see in coercive control, the actual violence is against the self, the sense of self. It's about eroding and degrading that person to a sense where they have no self-esteem left, where mm. they are basically, to survive, they need to make the perpetrator more powerful inside themselves than they are so that they can see the world through the perpetrator's eyes and second-guess their next move. Mm. Now, in Scotland, what they're doing at the moment, what well, they've done across the whole UK, but Scotland's really the gold standard, is that they've actually criminalised domestic abuse. So right now in Australia, domestic abuse is not a crime. Assaults are crimes. Stalking mm. is a crime. But most of what happens in these households is permissible. Mm. So installing GPS trackers, using spyware, you know, micro-regulating a woman's behaviour, insisting that what just happened in front of her didn't happen to the point where she feels like she's going insane. None of that is illegal. But you know what? In Scotland now it is. Mm. OK. And so that, the question is, you know, can, can this, the, the sentencing seems to be grossly inadequate. You're seeing to say, yes, it is, and what can be done differently. Hannah, you've got personal experience of, of this. What's, what's your thoughts? Um, well, I think, and I look to countries that have dealt with it well. Uh, relative to Australia and again I go back to this double speak and you're absolutely right that we are and have leaders who speak in ways and unwittingly or deliberately where they uh, message and give signals to men in terms of male behaviour um, and put their hand in the hand of and embrace the values of someone like Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And But how can we change it to make so, it better? So the countries who get it right and the environments that get it right have a strong commitment to human rights, mm. which we don't, alongside gender equity and a commitment to economic and gender equity. Well, hang on, we're we talking Brazil at the moment. There's a few problems there in terms of human rights. Well, the, I'm not saying Brazil is the best one. By I'm talking about the, you know, the Netherlands and those sorts mm. of countries and Finland and, and the countries that have really uh, reduced in a consistent way uh, time and again, not who've gone from extraordinary abuse to then, you know, relatively better outcome. Mm. But countries who have consistently uh, addressed the issues of violence towards women. And, and I find it problematic and disconcerting that we're saying, oh, well, you know, the gender equity conversation hasn't worked and we still have increased incidents of violence towards women. What is it that we're getting wrong? What we're getting wrong is the doublespeak. It's mm, the attitude mm, mm. that gives legitimacy 100%. to the treatment of women. If okay. I can just... In, in, in my just chapter... Just let Mona I, and then you, Noka. I, in the chapter I wrote on violence, I looked into... Uh, in the US, for example, not everybody can even call the police so that it can even be a case. Because if you're a person of colour and you call the police in a domestic violence case, some invariably someone is going to be killed or hurt and it actually is... Is, is more harmful for a woman of colour in many communities, especially black women, to call the police. And I'm always taken back to a quote by feminist psychiatrist Judith Herman who said the legal system was designed to protect men from the superior power of the state and not to protect women and children from the superior power of men. So, and when we talk about the police, the police themselves are sometimes domestic mm -hmm. abusers. Mm -hmm. So unless... So, and who in the United States... I'm, I'm sure it's the same in, in Australia. Who in the United States would call the police if there's a domestic violence incident and would hope to survive? It would be white people. So it's not working for us as people of colour. And it, when it comes to the sentencing, it's like what I said about civility and respectability. This is a legal system that is set up against us. This entire game is rigged. And you look across the world, I mean, I'm glad there are positive examples, but the entire system is rigged. And so there's another legal specialist called Mary Ann Franks who wrote a law article in which she says, we need optimal, viol optimal levels of violence where men think twice before being violent to a woman. And she, a law professor, is saying that women need to 
practice justifiable violence against men's unjustifiable violence, and men need to be less unjustifiably violence against women. Okay. I think this I just, is the system. Okay. Now, to answer your question, I think we have to be really wary of having a carceral response to an issue like domestic violence, because, well, what's the aim? What are we trying to do? We want to stop violence happening. We want to stop the harm happening. So. What happens? We call the police and, in, you know, in an ideal, in this scenario, in an ideal world, there'll be, there's, a, you know, a minimum sentence of, you know, a mandatory sentence of however long, I don't know how many years you're looking for. Um, but then what happens, you know, these largely men are going to extremely violent institutions, extremely violent. There is no chance of rehabilitation. They come out and then what happens? So we can't, I think we need to reimagine the way that we're dealing with this harm because these are our, they are our brothers. They are our, not black, I'm, you know, your brothers. They, they're, our, they're our neighbours, they're our teachers, they are police officers, they are politicians. This is everywhere. And what kind of, how do we want to work with them to get better? But if we just, if our answer, like the elderly, is just to lock away the problem, which doesn't actually solve it, it just makes it worse. Mm. Like what? But, and but there are people who want to, who do want to stay with their partners, and but want their partners to get better. But if our only answer is incarceration, then and we do have stuck. a related question. To this, but just before we finish this one, is the answer not then to try and do, which is the current discussion in this country, try and make the court system uh, better protective of women, and because it, but the family violence. You know, the family court is riddled with violence to make our police women more prevalent in that system so women feel more comfortable. Is that not the answer? My mum was a police officer, so... <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think more... It's a patriarchal institution. It's not going to... It doesn't really... It doesn't do much. But the other thing I just want to say is that when we see carceral responses to social issues, particularly Aboriginal women, and as we're seeing, we've, there's been a huge increase in the amount of Aboriginal women that are incarcerated and women in general, it's higher than the rates of men that have, that have gone up. So while we might think, yeah, let's lock them up, who, who are the people that also get caught up in that? Mm. And there are also a lot of women who accident, well, you know, police misidentify them as yep. the perpetrator. Mm. OK, um, look, let's go to our next question because time will run out on us tonight. This one's from Nicole Lee. So, disabled women are twice as likely to be victims of violence and a third of disabled women will be uh, victims of domestic and family violence. Um, how can we increase awareness of disability gendered violence when we don't get invited to the discussions? Jess? Mm. Well... I mean, the stats on this are shocking. Yeah. The stats are shocking and especially in situations where, you know, if women are reliant on their carers who are also their abusers, there's very little choice that they feel like they can have. Um, Nicole, full disclosure, interviewed for my book and, um, and she's one of the most fierce and brave advocates that I've ever met. Um, and what she said to me once really stuck with me is it's like, we are not vulnerable by virtue of being disabled. We are vulnerable because the state makes us vulnerable. Yes. Mm. We should not have to rely on men who abuse us to care for us. And that's really where it's at, right? Yep. You know, and you were told, you know, when you bravely left your partner, if I may say, yep. you know, it took them weeks to just let mm. you know about the package that was available to you that would help you take a shower, that mm. would help you get your kids to school, that would enable you to stay separate from the man who had viciously abused you for years. And that was because these, all of these sectors, they operate in silos and they don't speak to each other. And I think that disabled services are different from family violence services. Mm. And part of the answer to this, not just for disabled women, but for all women that are going through this, is for these people to get together and collaborate instead of working at cross purposes or competing for clients or passing women like you from one service provider to the next in which you're basically just spending all of your days trying to figure out what, how you're gonna get the help that you need. Just, Nicole, let me ask you, how, how do you think you can increase the awareness? What do you think needs to change? 
Well, I've been very lucky. I got to be part of Jess's book and she interviewed me and I do get invited into feminist spaces. I'm speaking at Broadside on the weekend. But I'm only one person and I've only got one story to tell. What we need to do is make room for other women with disabilities from different demographics, different backgrounds, different diversities in these spaces as well and in more mainstream spaces. So we get to come into feminist spaces, which is fantastic, but in more of the mainstream spaces like this, um, we've gotten, there's quite a lot of us that speak on the drum uh, quite regularly, um, but when it comes to Q&A, when it comes to even things like uh, other, um, I guess, uh, uh, forums such as this, we don't tend to get included in the conversation. Or if we do, it's only because it's a disability special. Mm. I've got things to say that aren't just related to being disabled. Mm. I mean, I, I've got things that interact with all aspects of society. And, and you know, um, the rates that we experience violence are quite horrific. And as mm. Jess said, um, some of the things that kept me so inherently stuck was the fact that the sectors didn't link up. And I'm trying very hard as an individual within the family violence sector point out that we are victims of violence and the rates are horrific. And this happens to Indigenous disabled women as well as, yeah. Yeah. You, know, um, you know, LGBTI disabled women mm -hmm. and also disabled men. But I go to the disability sector and, and I talk about violence and, and people are really uncomfortable about it. Mm. I talk about violence in the family violence sector and people are really uncomfortable because I've got a disability. So I get sidelined in both yeah, arenas. It's like you don't yeah. fit. Yeah. I don't yeah. fit in, in either. Slot. I make mm. both sectors uncomfortable, yet yeah. both sectors need to be talking to each other yeah. if we want to even get yeah. close to dealing I'd with I'd imagine as well on. for people who are trying to leave... Think about this with Indigenous women, but I imagine it's the same in the disability community. Like, there's trying to leave and there's that battle, you know, in the home. Mm. But then once you go to services and then facing ableism or yes. facing, like, racism or whatever, mm. it just... It's, once you it's find in, the services. Yeah, yeah, it's just another layer, like, yeah. another thing right. that makes it harder to yeah, leave. The overlap with mm. ageism exactly. is mm. tremendous. And, and that goes a little discussed. But I think when we talk about the sectors not relating to each other, we're talking about these different forms of oppression, I do think the sort of zooming way out answer is to address all these oppressions at once, because when you chip away at the fear and ignorance that underlies any form of it, you, you do chip away. I mean, I think activism is intersectional also. I and I think at the broadest level, that is how the, we can capitalize on all these movements happening in all these sectors together. It's so hard, isn't it, though, because you get trapped in your own ism, you know, and there's a hierarchy of isms then. And anyway, our next question not. comes from Beth Kay. Thanks, Fran. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of discussion of toxic masculinity and its impacts on society. Uh, but my question for the panel is, aren't the constraints of femininity and masculinity toxic in themselves? And what does positive masculinity look like? Mona? Hmm. Ha. Ha. You know, I find it really fascinating that um, we've, we've heard about so many instances of male violence against women, that real incidents whether it's disabled women or women in domestic abuse of all forms of abilities. And yet, when I talk about imaginary violence against men, everyone's like, oh my God, Mona wants us to kill men. <laughs> and I'm just asking you to imagine a scenario that is the daily reality for women everywhere. I agree with you that yes, the gender binary is long overdue, let's get rid of it, fuck the gender binary, yes. But <laughs> we are also talking about a society that socializes boys and men into believing that they are entitled to women's time, bodies, love, affection. In the United States, that has a direct impact into boys as young as 16 going into school and shooting to death half their class because a girl said no. So what would positive masculinity look like? I have no fucking idea. Okay. <laughs> Hannah, <laughs> Hannah. Uh, positive masculinity is an empowered woman <clears throat> who, <laughs> who, who raises and teaches and, and um, will nurture attitudes of respect towards women. I... I, I sign on to that. No, you could. Oh, <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to do this. <laughs> like, that positive masculinity does exist amongst men. Like, it does exist. Like, I see it... You know, I see it sometimes amongst my uncles or I see it... You know, my brother, for example, I think there, there are examples out there. 
you know, when we... Yeah, I, I just... I don't want to live in a world where it's like, well, all men are crap, so whatever. Mm. And it's, it, I think it's kind of reductionist to... There's something, sorry, full disclosure, I'm pregnant with twins and my brain is absolutely fried. No, no, but the point is you're pregnant with twins and I don't know what they are, but they might be boys, therefore you've got to be thinking about positive no, masculinity. No, I, I have, I seriously have been thinking about this. Congratulations. And I, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, what, oh, like, initially I was scared. I was like, what if I raise a cis straight man? <laughs> like, what am I going to do? <laughs> um, but that's just, I think that's, Crap, I, I, this thing that, this masculinity and femininity, mm. like for, for me, they're things to be played with, that we can have fun with them, that they can be traps for a lot of people. I think particularly white kind of patriarchy and white patriarchal values traps people. And I kind of feel sorry for dudes. Like scented candles are really beautiful. I brought my brother one the other day <laughs> and I'm like, man, you've missed out for, like, nearly 30 years because <laughs> men aren't meant to do it. But I think... I don't know. I think the softness and the beauty and the positivity is there. I don't... Yeah, anyway, I'm rambling. Jess? You're I'm stopping rambling. you rambling now. Jess, uh -huh. help me. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> you don't need rescuing ever. Um, I think that positive masculinity looks like positive humanity. Um, I think that... Before, like, imagine us talking about what does positive femininity look like? I don't know. When I, as I grew up, I didn't think about being a woman. I just felt thought about being a person. Um, unfortunately, sometimes as I grew older, I was reminded how very much I was a woman, especially when I was sexually harassed. And, you know, but that was like an imposition on what I basically felt was our fundamental humanity. Um, what does positive masculinity look like? It looks like getting back in touch with who you are as people and not trying to define yourself by being one or the other. Not, and especially not trying to define yourself by not being a girl, because that's what toxic masculinity teaches us. It's like, you know, you are a man primarily by rejecting, you know, feminine features like compassion and understanding and talking and having best friends, you know. And scented candles. And scented and candles. And scented candles. And All right. Knows, no, I'm going to... me through hard I'm times. only winding us up because we... I'm going to squeeze in one last question. I shouldn't, so we've got one last question and we've all got to be very, very short with the answer. This one's from Timothy Moore. My question returns to ageing and celebrating the positive aspects of ageing. And in particular, um, one important thing about ageing is knowledge and knowledge transfer. We've spoken a lot tonight about the ne negative aspects of cultural transmission, white patriarchy, but can we flip that around and think about what positive feminist advice you have received from your elders? OK, very quickly, let's go down the table. Ashton. Uh, well, I, I'll, I will say that I don't think all older people are wise. I think lots of children <laughs> are wise, um, but we, we are experienced. And I think um, it's important to, to listen to each other and not allow the, the, the value of a human being to expire over time is really the ugly heart of ageism. So to, to give equal value to <laughs> everyone from you know, from the moment we're born on, because aging is living, aging is moving through life. It is not being sick, it is not dying. So to look at the entire life course and think how we can support learning from each other through contact across the generations, let's break down age segregation, let's work on all these causes at all ages and make those efforts intersectional and intergenerational, and that way we'll pass on everything we all know. And just so you all know, that wasn't short, so my... <laughs> Okay, Very I'm, short. I'm just going to tell you what I've learned as I've gotten older, because I'm 52 years old. The older I get, the queerer I am. And my partner is a bisexual man. And I'm urging the straight, the cis straight men out there, there is something deeply broken the, in you and in the way that you move through the world. As you get older, learn from people like us so that this can be a better world. Be queerer. Be more bisexual. <laughs> Be less cisgendered in okay. the way that you move through the world. Just fuck it all up and be free. <laughs> Hannah, what positive advice have you had from your elders and take it where you want? Um, well, again, I mean, for me, this is about the contribution of uh, cultural diversity into this conversation. We, um, notwithstanding abuse and violence and, and all the issues we've covered, um, but we afford 
absolute dignity and respect and wisdom to ageing population. So it ties in with the whole conversation around aged care. And we only have a single model that is born out of Anglo-Celtic ways of thinking about treating the elderly who are no longer useful in society. So I think it'll be a good idea to consider um, thinking about those who've acquired wisdom okay. throughout life. Mayuka, short answer. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> I just I spent the day up at Shepparton yesterday and was at Rumbalara and I visited some of my old aunties um, there and they were filthy, a lot of sex jokes. Um, but something, yeah, something my auntie Audrey said um, was that you have to laugh. So I think that is something I've been trying to do. Yeah, you got to laugh is a pearl. <laughs> Great yeah. advice. It is a pearl. Jess? My, my nonna was my rock and um, she campaigned for the rights of writers and I, I used to sit at her dining room table and fold leaflets campaigning for the freedom of Ken Sarawiwa, a Nigerian mm -hmm. activist and many others. And she taught me, she imbued in me that writing was a way to keep the bastards honest. And so I became a writer. Another pearl. That's all we've got time for tonight. Can you please thank our panel? <laughs> Ashton Abeltai, Mona El Dahawi, Hana Asafiri, Nayuka Gori, and Jess Hill. You can continue this discussion on Facebook and Twitter. Next week, Tony Jones is back in the chair with economics professor Ross Garno, whose new book calls for Australia to seize the opportunity to become a renewable energy superpower. A leading voice from Silicon Valley, Sarah Fryer, is the CEO and founder of the local neighbourhood social media platform Next Door. The Shadow Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Mark Butler. That's it. So long and farewell. Thank you. <laughs>